we are now live and uh, welcome Drew and Yuval. Oh, Yuval disappeared. He's back. Welcome everybody to another edition of Maple Academy. And today we're going to be learning about AI, but it's not going to be beginner fluffy stuff. We're learning from two experts, two uh, instructors that teach companies and brands how to use AI to create traction in the marketplace. And so we're going to have, first, we're going to have Drew talk about Midjourney and how to rebrand your company. And then we're going to have Yuval talk about the UX side, how to create content, product pages, other cool things for e-com brands. And before we start, why don't we get everybody to just say hi and where you're from on the comments. And I think we should yeah, wait a few minutes for everyone to show Let's not be up. shy on this, right? Like we're going into, some of us are going into the holiday, maybe have a short week. You know, it's the afternoon. Come on, let's let's have some conversation here. I can't see the comments, by the way. Hold on. Or or the amount of people that are here. Oh yes, I can see. Hello, Will. What's up? Will from UK. We're in the UK. Nigeria, oh, wow. Very cool. Do you guys have snow in Nigeria right now? Arizona, Texas. That's awesome. Hmm. Yeah, I think Will's no, right. See I've, I've noticed that it's usually a little bit delayed with what comes through, but uh, thanks for letting us know either way. Switzerland. How do you say that? No, we don't. They don't have snow in Nigeria. Fake news. Hey, you never know. My brother moved to Iowa and they have snow. You never think of Iowa having snow. but You don't? I think of Iowa having snow. I don't know. Cornfields in the snow? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, man. I guess if you're from the Midwest, I'm from Midwest, so I guess I understand it, but I I guess I could see that. Portugal, very cool. All right. Amazing. So now that everyone introduced themselves, Drew, why don't you uh, take it away, man? Yeah, let's let's do this thing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Oh. And I'm going to jump up here which is where we're starting, right? And I think this is going to be, look, the reality is this is gonna be a, fa a fantastic session for anybody attending because of what you've all got lined up, what we're gonna talk about with this. And so, um, you know, with, with rebranding an AI using Midjourney, I think this is a fantastic topic. It's a topic that is pretty cutting edge, I would say, in a lot of ways. And so I'm gonna talk you through that today. Who am I? Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Brainchild, which basically solves um, you know, this branded imagery at scale problem that a lot of companies have, right? Because they don't want to utilize stock photography because it's not them. They don't want to pay a photographer to get, you know, a finite number of shots, or maybe they don't have a designer, right? So there's this gap in the middle that AI can solve with image generation and your brand. And then, um, you know, just my other experience outside of that, I've worked primarily in the SaaS startup space. So a lot of early stage uh, companies in the B2B world, uh, most recently at a company called Lasso, where I was the VP of marketing, I was in charge of a team of five over there. And so uh, I'll dive into that, but that's kind of how we got started with uh, today's topic. And then lastly, like I do photography and design on the side, which also blends into sort of this, uh, you know, message that I'm going to deliver today and how I got started using Midjourney. So for, you know, today's takeaways, what I hope you walk away with is understanding a little bit about AI's role in changing branding, because I do think it's it's going to change branding forever. Uh, there are current challenges that a lot of teams face, which I just mentioned. Uh, a few of those things like stock, professional photography, resources, et cetera. Um, some of the key competitive advantages that come along with utilizing technology and the new possibilities with AI. And then lastly, like 
we're going to get into tactical stuff, use cases, outcomes. What can you do with this stuff, right? How does this take place in the business world and provide value for you, your team, your brand? Uh, before we sort of get into the specifics with MidJourney, let's talk about AI's impact on imagery at scale, because this is insane. I mean, 15 billion with a B images have been created using AI since last year. So that's 34 million roughly a day, which is crazy when you really think about it. And then also, also on the other side, right, more AI images have been generated than the last 150 years of photography in just a year, right? So that's what kind of scale and velocity we're talking about here. And uh, this is what's coming. And, and hopefully today you have a, a little bit better of a, a baseline and benchmark as to how to use this or how it's going to impact you and your team. So mid journey, what is it? Um, you know, I think one of the things that would help is to really understand, uh, you know, how familiar you are with the tool, right? So whether you're just getting into it, whether you've used it a few times, uh, essentially what mid journey is, is a text to image tool, right? So this is going to basically you utilize a prompt. It's going to generate images for you. Yes, there are other tools outside of mid journey. Mid journey is my preference because of the quality uh, of the images. And also, uh, I think it just does some things better than the rest, right? So you've probably heard of like Dolly, which is, you know, OpenAI's um, tool, which is now multi-modality in, inside of GPT. You've got uh, Leonardo, Sta Stable Diffusion, or a few others that you may have heard of. So uh, the important thing to keep in mind, MidJourney and all these tools, they create all kinds of images. These are not just photorealistic images. These are sketches, cartoons, illustrations, uh, you know, specific art styles from like the 1970s, like wh whatever it is, MidJourney can probably do it. And so it's important to keep that in mind as we're going through this, because a lot of what I'm going to show you is a little bit more on the photorealism side, but there are plenty of use cases outside of that. And depending on, you know, your business or your niche, they could apply to you as well. So diving in to MidJourney, exploring it, what does this look like? Well, I think I got into MidJourney uh, late December of last year, maybe the very beginning of this year. And I just been hearing about it and hearing about it. And it looked uh, far, farther enough, far enough along that it was enticing uh, to play around with, right? It wasn't at a stage where it was like spitting out a bunch of goofy images. And so like to me, uh, it had gotten to a place where it was like, yeah, I, I, I need to explore this. In particular for me as a photographer, right? And somebody who's now had twin girls or two years old, like my time for hobby photography or anything like that has gone out the window. I don't have hours to edit anymore. I don't have you know, the time to take all my gear, pack it all up, drive somewhere or travel specifically to shoot stuff. Could I do it? Yes. Do I have the, the opportunity to do it as much as I like? No. Right. So the reality is that mid journey allows you to create any type of image from your desk. Right. Which is incredibly powerful. Now, going back to how it's evolved. Right. And the quality levels improved. You know, I mentioned I got involved probably around this time here. But if you go back to V1, V2, these are all utilizing the same prompt with Spider-Man. V1, V2, you can't even tell what this is, right? You have no idea what this is. V3, you get some, you know, resemblance to what could be like a Spider-Man, like knitted thing. I have no idea what that is. But V4 is really where it started to turn the corner and uh, really kind of opened my eyes in terms of like, hey, this was fun, but now it's got utility. Right. Because once you look at this stage on, you see how much better it's gotten. This is the current version we're in right now. And then Mid Journey is set to launch a V6 by the end of this year. Uh, so that'll take place in December. But that's going to take an even larger jump in terms of the text coherence with your prompts and the quality. So I mentioned the fun versus utility part. This was the realization, right, where it was just like, hey, this is cool to create these images, but what can I do with them? Then, right, it got to a point where the quality was good enough where it's like, I could actually use this in business. And photorealism in particular has gotten so incredibly good, so incredibly fast. And I'll just do this to prove my point here. Um, but I'm going to show you two slides. Each of them's got two images. I want you to guess which one is real um, out of the two images. So you've got number one, number two. This is in Santorini, Greece. You've probably seen this. Um, but give me a quick guess as to what you got. 
Uh, ben, I can't, I can't see, but if you could kind of give me an indication if we're getting like mixed results or leaning one way or the other, that would be helpful. Okay, so I can't, I can't tell, but I'm assuming it's probably a, a mix of both. The image that is real is the image on the left. This is the real image. This is the AI generated image, right? So yes, there are some subtle differences. Yes, like the colors aren't the same necessarily. I could have gotten this to a closer, you know, similarization in terms of the style, but I wanted to provide something that was co comparable uh, enough. And then, you know, if you really look hard is really where you could kind of see some of the details, right? This water maybe is just a little bit flat or smooth. Um, but at the same time, if you're a photographer, you know that you can do things with the camera that can also achieve this effect. Uh, let's do the same for this one. Two images, which one is real? So you've got number one or number two. I'll give you guys a second so we can make this fun. Also assuming there's probably a little bit of a mixed bag here, the image on the left, in this case is also real. So this is real, this is with AI. Uh, and really the only indicator here is a slight one, which is basically the girl's hair blowing right and you've got some of this grassy stuff blowing left, right? And that could happen in camera, but that maybe is a little bit of a giveaway. The point is, is this is close enough, right? And it's only going to get better from here. It's only gonna improve. And I've run this test on LinkedIn a few times, right? With several images lined up, maybe five or six. And I'll tell you like probably one in every 15, 16, we'll get them all right, right? So it's very hard to spot the differences consistently through a series of images. Um, now let's get into how sort of this has use case in business and some of the challenges that teams are currently facing with branding, right? So this was me, this was my team. I had a team of three or four other marketers. We were in a fast paced startup, right? Limited budget, no designer in house. Um, you know, and, and it's tough to find images that felt like our niche, right? We were in live event production and there's just not a lot of good photography out there. So that was uh, indicative of sort of me having this moment of, wow, okay, midgers come a long way in the quality and I'm having these challenges. How do I solve it? The current solves are with stock photography and like a photographer designer right? And they both have issues. Stock photography is limited in terms of the customization. It's, I, I, I like to describe it as like going to a bargain bin and trying to find something that kind of fits, you know, like it, it probably doesn't fit your brand. And even if it does, how are you going to find several images in a row that fit your brand that are unique to you, right? Because other people are probably using. Them. And then, you know, on the photographer designer side, obviously this is a more expensive route. Um, even if you have these people on your team, right? they could probably be doing other things or utilizing this to leverage uh, their efficiency. If you're a marketer, uh, you've probably seen some of these images before. I call these the usual suspects because we've all uh, probably seen one of these photos used across some business website before, right? The headshots are the same. Some of these same shots are used across blogs or products or whatever it is, right? But the point is, is it's not authentic and it doesn't speak specifically to your audience. Um, backing up a little bit in terms of all of the sacrifices that you make when you go the stock route or the photographer route or the designer route, right? Like this is just a quick list. There are more, right? But when you get on the stock side, obviously you're making a lot of compromises, right? Inauthentic, limited customization, consistency, all problems. You get on the photographer designer side, weighs a little bit more heavily on the time and the money. Right. But those things all factor in very, very heavily. And so when I sort of realized all this, I thought, you know, what? I wonder if I could put this together in a real use case. And so we did just that. Uh, we had a customer only event that we put together and we were building a landing page for it. Everything that's outlined or underlined or circled in black was basically with the help of AI. Right. So ChatGPT or an LLM to help us do some of the copy here. The imagery was done specifically. Uh, in mid journey. And that allowed me to create a very thematic uh, experience for that customer event. And we 
basically did a bunch of swag at the event as well, right? So we had, we called it the campfire, but we had candles that smelled like sort of like a bonfire. We had t-shirts, um, coasters, some other swag items, but they all were branded with mid-journey imagery, right? So this, this became a real life, real life use case that was sort of this eye-opening aha moment because it was like, well, if we could do it for that, what else could we do it for, right? And so then it became this thing, well, we can we could queue up our audience in here, right? Here are the people that use our product or uh, are a part of the live event production community or they're an ideal customer profile. We can create custom icons, the event, like I mentioned, we can start to utilize images on the website, right? Like, so this is just uh, what a typical owner of one of these event companies looks like that was generated in mid-journey. We could do something silly with a campaign, right? Like, so we had Benjamin Franklin holding, you know, a phone, which looked like he was reacting to something on the Lasso app uh, about an event update in real time. We utilize these things across case studies, right? Where, you know, these images just don't exist on the stock photography site. And so what we did was ultimately build this branded photo library that we could use across the board for all use cases, right? That infused our creativity, our personality, our brand colors, our, um, you know, the specific lighting that takes place, the diversity uh, of the people that, um, you know, we sell to our customer. And then, you know, apply that to all the use cases, because if we build this branded library, our team, my team can take any image, right? Whether it's for social, ad creative, um, mood boards, right? Product mockups, for the website, sales collateral, training material, and basically have a bottomless pit of on-brand resources to pull from and use. And this just is, a, it's incredible time to be alive, so to speak, because this is just fascinating, right? To dial this level of customization into your brand and use it across the board is really key. And it's key because customers want authenticity, right? And you can't get authenticity through stock photography. You need to have something that feels like your brand. It feels somebody can put themselves in the shoes of some of these images, right? Um, 86% of consumers prefer an authentic brand image and 94 say they recommend brands they have an emotional connection with. These are things that you cannot do, right? In the current space of stock photography. So that's why you should care, right? The money, time and compromises, but some of the other things, right? Are the competitive advantage it provides for you, you versus maybe your competitor, they're using stock, you're not, right? That's, that's an entirely storytelling uh, you know, avenue that you could go, go down to position yourself better in the market, enhances creativity for your team, augments the people on your team to move faster and quicker, um, and more tools at their you know, disposal, so to speak. And so that's why you should care. Um, brands are already using this. You know, so here are just some images, you know, Coke's been using, right? So you can see all of these were created in a tool like Midjourney. I think it was probably Midjourney they created these in. Um, but these are out in the wild today. Fashion brands are already using these. Bigger brands are already investing a lot of time and effort into this creation. Uh, the last thing I'm going to get into before maybe a little bit of show and tell is how you do this, right? How do you create this branded library? Well, uh, you know, I think you need to go through a discovery process with your brand and maybe you already have this with your brand guidelines, right? So what are the things that describe your brand? Adjectives, feelings, right? What you do, the niche, who's your target audience? Um, and I mean, really your target audience, right? So if I know the target audience is me, a 37 year old white guy, like I can create that and I can create what, what I'm wearing even, right? So if there's specific attire that they wear, uh, on the flip side, if I've got a diverse um, audience, right, or it's an older audience, I can specify those things in the prompt and get a very, very specific customization to the images I'm creating. Any core visuals, right, or what you want your, you know, uh, core values or any, you know, visual communications that you want to have through the images, what you want them to express, right? So going through this brainstorming exercise of all these things, are you taking you know, do you want photos of just people? Are there items? Are there locations that are interesting to your brand that describe you? What what colors are involved? What are your brand colors? Um, are you going for a certain look that's dark and moody? Or are you going for something that's light and airy, right? So all these things can describe your brand. So um, just for the sake of time, I'll skip a few of these. Image dimensions, um, you know, with stock or something like that, you're typically given either a vertical profile, a landscape or a square, and that's it. Well, in something like Mid Journey or an AI tool, 
you can create any size you want. You want something that's made specifically for Instagram and that resolution, done, right? So all these things become a, a possibility for you to unlock. Now, how do you get there, right? Like, how do you create this bottomless library of on-brand images? Well, I think you do it through something called prompt templates, right? So you, you kind of figure out and experiment what's going to work. And these are two specifically that I've used before and that I used in my previous role that worked quite well and well enough to where I could use them time and time again to create different unique images that had a consistent flow, look and feel to them, right? So I can specify the job title, what they're wearing, what they're doing, where the background or the location is, what kind of lighting it is, a couple things to describe it, right? Whether it's a candid shot or um, whether it's like a, a certain angle of the shot, side profile, up above, wh whatever. And then the AR just stands for aspect ratio, which basically just means, right, the, the dimensions. So what we were just talking about with landscape, horizontal, what have you, right? So all these things can be tailored. And once you've identified these, you can, you're off and running. You can create these forever and have unique images of forever. So that's sort of the key element, right, is all of that. Um, I think what I'd like to do uh, for the last couple minutes here is probably just go over to Mid Journey. And again, I don't know if you've been in here or not, but right now Mid Journey to prompt utilizes Discord. You have to have Discord to use it. Mid Journey is going to move away from Discord here in the near future. That's all gonna be happening through their website. But for now, this is basically how you do it. There is a, a little bit of a technique to this, right? Um, but I'm just gonna go ahead and utilize something here using that template, right? So I could say AV, um, well, let's even specify an age. Like I could do a 32 year old male AV crew member dressed in all black because that's what these people would typically wear when they're setting up the show. So these are the people that do the lighting, the video, the stage setup for any live event, like a concert, a festival. Um, let's have them do something like setting up uh, the stage with AV equipment, like what I have above here um, for the consistency, right? Like there are certain elements of the brand that I want to come through and use time and time again. So for us, it was moody yellow lighting was one of those things. Um, I'll just put 4K for, for the resolution. And then, you know, for the aspect ratio, right, this could be a number of things. Um, for the sake of this, I'll, I'll put it in multiple formats. So we could do a one by one. Let's just let's just do this to start. We'll do a square image to start, which is the default. And then what I can do is then I can take that same prompt and let's put it into a landscape and let's put it into a vertical shot. And what's going to happen here is it's going to show us the generation of this photo in real time. Uh, this will only take a minute, but this is pretty neat. And it's going to give us a grid that looks like this. There's four images. This is one, two, three, and four. And then below here, you have uh, a couple of different things that uh, are, are listed here. U stands for upscale, which means, hey, look, like I like this image. I want to make a bigger version of it, right? So for resolution's sake or V stands for variation. So maybe I like certain components of this image and I wanna vary it in some degree, right? So I wanna see what comes up with after that. All right, so now we've got these back, right? Like we've got some of these images back, I can take a look through here and it's like, okay, there's there are some in here that may look a little wonky and that's sort of where AI is, right? Like sometimes you're gonna think, get things where somebody's got like a six finger um, or there's like something proportionally that's off. Uh, so there is a little bit of experimentation and re-rolling with this, but like, let's just say number three looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and click U3. So it's going to create a larger file of that. Um, I could also say, hey, look, like I like this as a base image. So like, let's vary it and see what, you know, Mid Journey comes up with. And then lastly, like, let's run it again. Let's refresh it or re-roll it to get four new images using the same prompt, right? So we did all that. Now we've got sort of this same prompt in landscape format, right? And there are certain elements of this that come through, right? And so this looks pretty good. This looks pretty good. I could upscale these. 
if I wanted to create more grids or have more to choose from, I could re-roll it or I could make a slight change to the prompt, right? So like, let's say I wanted a 35 year old female AV crew member. I could go ahead and change that. And then it would spit out four new things here. And then lastly, we've got sort of this, this vertical format, right? So same prompt, but just a different aspect ratio, right? And so we could say, okay, the, you know, U3, and maybe I want to see what else is out there. Um, so all of these, th you know, all of these sort of like avenues start to present themselves as you're going through this process. And it's, it's very, very intriguing uh, if you've got to create a bone in your body because there are countless possibilities, right? So this was that first image we, we upscaled. It's like, okay, this looks pretty good. Um, now I wanted to maybe vary it slightly or strongly. I could, I could do that here. Uh, if I wanted to maybe remove something from an image um, that stands out. So like, maybe I find this distracting. I can select this, hit submit. And basically like generative fill in Photoshop, um, it's going to basically look at the pixels across the board and present some different options for what will go in that space instead. Um, like we mentioned, we can upscale those images. We can zoom out, right? So if we want to now go back a little bit further from the scene, we can do that. Or, right, like let's say I, cr so I created this in a one by one square format, but I want to change it to a landscape. I can do that here, right? So this gives you that flexibility. And Again, using that same generative fill technology, it's going to take this image and then basically pull it out, you know, outward, and it's going to fill in space on the left and right side of the image to give us uh, some options there. So, uh, as you can see, right, like there are there are countless things that you can do with this. Um, plenty uh, of ways that you can tweak this to your own brand, and um, yeah, let me stop sharing and, and I guess pop off and see if anybody's got any questions. Drew, I got a question. Shoot. How long would the process take for a project? Like, let's say you need, I don't know, your entire website redone and you're starting from scratch. Yeah, I, like it would depend if like on your on your experience and skill level already utilizing the tool in a lot of ways. I think, you know, just like anything else, a lot of this is about putting in the reps, you know, to, to sort of know what works or how to use it or the different features within the tool. But uh, for me, like, I think what it came down to was I was able to create the personas very quickly and get the colors, you know, pretty quickly as well, right? Which then got to this point of creating these templates, right? Things that were predictable in terms of, I could use these time and time again, pretty reliably anytime I needed them. And so what I ultimately did was spent like an hour or two in just ran them at scale, right? Like, and just created a bunch, picked through them, you know, really looked closely at the images too, to make sure there weren't anything, there wasn't anything off with them, right? Because like I mentioned, some of them aren't perfect, right? So like zooming in and really just making sure that they're, they're going to be usable uh, across your, your assets, wherever they're going to go. Um, and it's different for every brand, you know, it depends on your ICP, it depends on if you're going for photorealism, you know, so I, it's really difficult to say, but, uh, you know, I solved that problem for brands. So if you want to, you know, learn how to do it or get trained or you want to, you know, basically off, off, you know, outsource it, I can help you with that. Um, if, you know, you want to get better in general, I've got a lot of free content and resources available that I can give you to kind of, um, you know, get you started or moving a little bit more quickly with the tool. We actually have a question from Mark. Yeah, Mark, uh, two different ways, I would say, uh, primarily, right? Like one, going in and really just giving yourself the time and the space to fail and play with it and experiment. Uh, it's going to take a bit of time to do. But uh, the other side I would recommend is there are, there, there are a lot of people that are talking about it, whether it's on YouTube or myself. Um, you know, I've got a lot of content on LinkedIn specifically around MidJourney that helps with this. Um, you know, I've got a, a full guide basically that takes you from beginner to somebody that, you know, has really flattened the learning curve and could build this out on your own. So that's a possibility. Um, 
obviously there are YouTube videos out there, right? Like there are courses, there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. This is a fantastic question. Daniel, thank you for asking this. Um, so yes, right? Like some of those images specifically, I could, I could dial those in a little bit better. So utilizing keywords uh, or what Midjourney would call tokens, not to get too far in the weeds here, you can utilize some specific things like words like portrait, photorealism, maybe even specifying a certain camera or lens that's, that it's being taken with. Um, you can use words like uh, candid, um, asymmetrical, because Midjourney sometimes likes to make everything very symmetrical. Um, you could use a particular film style, like, uh, you know, like you could use camera film that people used in a certain era to dial in more of like an analog look. Uh, there, so there are plenty of ways to do it, but it primarily lies in sort of those specific keywords or tokens to get there, right? recommend a free alternative, what's the best you could re recommend in terms of like learning, I'm wondering, or um, creating these on your own, I'm not sure what you mean. I guess Mid Journey is pretty cheap, no? It's like 10 bucks. Yeah, so it's, it, I mean, it's relatively cheap, it's 10 bucks, uh, like Ben mentioned. I mean, I think you do have a cap on the, maybe the number of images you can create with the 10. I have the $30 a month plan and honestly, it's worth every penny. And I, you know, look, if you're, if you're talking about this in a business case too, your company should expense this, right? This isn't something that you should be paying out of pocket for. How do you fix hands or just one part of the picture? I'm not sure if you covered that. Yes. I, I just skimmed over it, but this is, this is also uh, an important part to mention, right? So there's a feature or a button there once you've upscaled an image called very region and basically allows you to select a lasso or a box, um, to regenerate a part of the picture. So like if I really like a picture and the only thing that's wonky about it is like a six finger, then I'm probably doing that, right? Because it's gonna be easier for me to dial that in than probably get something that's just as good, if not better. And so that's that's one way to do it is the very region. Sometimes if you even re-roll, like if you change it, like one of the very subtle or very strong, that can also do it too. It's just a little bit inconsistent. Amazing. My question was, can I take a picture of myself and then create branded images of myself? Man, you're not like so many people uh, have that question. It's it's a it's a good one. Um, yes, like th there are. There's a way to do it, although I would just say it. Currently, AI tools don't make it easy to do right. It's it's one of those loop arounds that you have to do so. Using Midjourney, there is a tool that you can invite into your Discord that basically says, hey, here's a picture of me, and now I want um, maybe me in a suit and tie with this backdrop or, or a man that's my age that has my kind of hair, right? And then I can basically face swap it. It'll do its best to basically put it in there and turn in a new result. And, and it's fairly good, right? So, like, let me, let me show you just a very quick example of that. Um, let's do this really quick. because I think this is interesting and it's timely. So a lot of you guys, well, maybe maybe you don't know, but Napoleon, the movie with Joaquin Phoenix just dropped. Uh, I think it came out today, right? Um, this was an image that I generated in Mid Journey that did not have Joaquin Phoenix's face, right? It was just a, a, an ordinary guy. I mean, he fit the scene, right? But like, if I want to really story tell, I could take you know, a, a portrait or a headshot of Joaquin Phoenix and then throw it in there. Right. And it did a damn good job at it, too. Right. Like this is insane that it can do that level of detail. Um, so, yes, it's possible, um, you know, with you, like it, it pretty much is through that tool as it stands right now. I don't know if that, you know, that's a new feature that will eventually happen, maybe. Um, but it's sort of a loop around way to do it as we stand right now. Amazing. Cool. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and um, stick around for the Q&A. We're going to have where you guys can continue asking Drew a bunch of questions. We can continue playing around with uh, 
with dropping our faces on the AI images. And now we're going to go to Yuval, and he's going to talk about ads and other amazing things. Hello. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome. Happy to have you here. Um, nice to meet you. So I'll dive right into the conversation, tuning in from Tel Aviv. Happy to have you, everyone. Um, let's go. So I'm sharing my screen and share screen and I share the entire screen. There you go. Ta-da. All right. Um, <clears throat> so um, great questions, great presentation by Drew. It um, slides really easily to, to my topic, which is about uh, more or less it's going to be about short recap of the history of uh, using AI tools, short recap, um, and uh, then we will move forward and talk about the practicalities. Um, okay, so let's start with the story. There is this guy in Israel, his name is Eyal Shani. And the thing about Eyal Shani is that he's a very famous chef. He just got his Michelin star uh, two weeks ago, I believe, his first Michelin star in New York. And is quite of an interesting character. Okay, so let me tell you about the story of Eyal Shani and myself. So I used to live in Tel Aviv once. I still am living in Tel Aviv, just in a completely different place. And I used to rent a flat right here. And there was a restaurant by Al Shani right here. So it's like five minutes walk. And I used to spend a lot of time in this place. I think they closed it since then. And what was unique about this place is that this guy was handling every piece of food that you can think of in a creative way inside of a pita bread. And that's a Yal Shani. Now, um, an interesting thing about a Yal Shani is the way that it describes the dishes that it creates. All right. So it's like being very, very creative with his dishes. And my story with AI, by the way, starts a uh, long time ago with Midjourney V version 2. Drew told you about the different versions of Midjourney. So I started in version 2 when everything was like blurry. And then um, in version 3, I started to see like, oh, I can do like cool stuff with it. So uh, I did something creative last year, which is taking the dishes, the description of the dishes of Eyal Shani, and just throw them into mid-journey with a prompt, just so we could see how the beautiful description, poetic dishes of Yalshani looks like if we let AI to paint them. So we have enchanted mushrooms, golden on hot steel, trade green onions, and sour cream. And voila, mid-journey painted them for us. And we have moussour fish in a stormy sauce of desert tomatoes. And there you have it. And by the way, this is version three. If I would create it right now and we could run an experiment afterwards where I run it again through version 5.2, we will see probably a better version of this illustration. By the way, I really like the creative notion of Midjourney, unlike other AI uh, painters. This is a wild sea creatures and fishing roads from the depth of the Mediterranean Sea. And right here, we have a lamp, a new happiness in his field in full of flowers. Voila. Oh, such an amazing painting. And that actually, this kind of an experiment that I did in like 10 minutes in mid-journey caught fire in a way that it went into national news. People share it all over the place. It's in Hebrew right now. People are like, Oh my God, there's this awesome, crazy project of AI that actually painting the dishes of Yal Shani. And I find myself having my 10 minutes of glory in the national news of Israel, specifically with this project where I painted with AI 
and dishes. And that's where my, my kind of love story began, not began, but kind of uh, even evolved uh, with me and AI. And since then, I've experimented a lot with different AI tools. And today I will just present to you a few examples of the stuff that you can actually do with AI tools. And my name is Yuval Keshtecher. I'm the founder and CEO of the UX Writing Hub, which is one of the biggest online education platform for writers in tech. So what I did in the past five years is to educate UX writers, people that work in product team, how to write better for digital experiences. The UX Writing Hub is a company that did a lot of writing projects for different very big brands and all of our students work in companies that you probably heard of such as google and every company that you can, that you can think of have a writer that probably uh, learned something made by the ux writing hub and in the last month i spent most of my energy to build an ai product and to help uh, the israeli government to locate civilians that were and kidnap and held hostage and uh, hopefully tomorrow a few of them are going to be uh, released and that was also an AI project that uh, was um, somehow uh, got into international news outlets and that's more or less about me. One thing that is important to say that this is not a legal advice so I don't know if we can or can't use this type of AI stuff in our work because I'm not a lawyer, but I know that there's going to be a lot of legal limitations and there's going to be a lot of legal uh, limitations and I'm not aware of like where the, the regulation is going to take us when it comes to AI. And all righty. So um, I have a confession to make. And my confession is that I made this presentation today. Now, the reason I made this presentation today is not only because I'm lazy, but also because the field of AI is changing by the day. Drew already showed you version one of Mid Journey that looks like a blurb and version six that's going to be by the end of the year that looks extremely, you know, very, very raw, very real. So everything, something new is happening. For example, the State Department prioritized AI-ready workforce in its first AI strategy. And this is from yesterday, basically. And so we learned that more and more companies are, and more governments are prioritizing things that are related to artificial intelligence. Sam Altman, going back to AI, to open AI after a very long drama, one week old drama of his leaving and then coming back. So it's crazy and it's very hard to keep on track on whatever is happening. And I have to create this presentation every time I do it to the exact same day, because every week you have a new feature and a new type of way to work with the AI. Let me give you an example. So six months ago, we had Ranio, Ra Runway Gen 1, and this is an ad created by AI. Now, I need to know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? No, we can't hear it. Can't hear? Hold on. No. Sorry. Maybe I can... Uh, stop sharing and then I will present share screen some screen let you share audio look for the share audio checkbox all right hmm hold on How about now? No. You know? Well, we can see it. It looks impressive. Okay, we will work with that for now. Basically, what we're here seeing right now is a commercial made by Runway for a beer company. It's all AI. 
Uh, you can see that it's not that smooth, um, but, but people could already notice the potential, even if it was one uh, six months ago already. So this is a runway, Gen 1, a commercial. It's okay if you can't hear it, and that's fine. We will just uh, do the visuals for now. Now, uh, three months ago, this person created a trailer for this amazing movie that is not even exist. I uh, wish you could hear the music because the music is also great. Uh, I can share with you the slides afterwards so you could check it yourself. But this is a creation for a, a, a trailer for a movie that was uh, only created by Mid Journey and Runaway Gen 2. So a new module for Runaway help you to create videos. Okay. You hear a little bit of the audio? I'm trying to bring my volume up here. So that's Genesis three months ago, and that's where we were. Now, two months ago, we had this amazing creator creating a video clip for his, uh, for his band. The name of the band is Betsefer. And he created Mid Journey and Runway also. That's a metal music video. Okay, so this is a, a video clip that you can create. Now let's move more to the commercial example. So the same guy that created the Betsefer video clip and created a commercial for a burger that is not really exist. So check it out. It's also Mid Journey and Pika Labs. Pika Labs is another creator. It's a bit similar to Mid Journey because it's based on Discord. So you could also use that to make your videos come alive. Okay, so that's the example of the video commercial. I'll show you one more example of a video commercial by the exact same guy. This is one month ago, and this is a, or like the, the burger commercial was fake. It was for a fake burger company, but people saw that it looks so cool. So they hired the same guy, Matan Grumi is his name, to do a commercial for uh, peanut butter for pets. Now, obviously, there is still post-production going on in these projects, and it's not that it takes uh, five minutes to create them. You still need to edit it using editing tools and so on. But now you can create really high-end high -end productions to your video commercials that you could put afterwards in your ads at a really low cost because you don't need cameraman, you don't need a huge budget you can do it actually from your home in like three four hours that's it 
one person show uh, that have the skills to use this type of tools. So that's one month ago. And now there are f- more example like Hagen Labs that can help you to uh, do live um, original English and then automatically create like a Spanish version of the exact same uh, video. So you can also localize your ads easily using tools like that. Imagine you have an ad in one in one language and then you could just transform it to a different language. And so that's really cool. And two weeks ago, ChatGPT decided to introduce like this all-in-one ChatGPT that you could create images in DALI inside of ChatGPT and then like use all of it in like the same uh, flow, which is really, really cool. Um, and last week, we've received a new type of feature, which is GPTs, which is the one I'm going to focus on for the last part of my presentation. Um, so yeah, that's more or less about that. I'm going to skip this part since Drew covered most of it. And yeah, so right now you have GPTs as part of your chat GPT flow. And which is really cool. You can create your own personal AI assistants that will do more or less uh, anything you tell them to do. So I have one GPT, their goal is to, this. the goal of this one is to be my personal UX writer. I call it Agent Wordsmith. I have the Edit Wiz, which is my personal editor. I have the Design Academy Architect, which is one that helped me to create my AI digital course. And so on, you have like also, uh, and those would be the one that I've created. You have also one that you could use. For the sake of this, uh, um, of this talk, I created a new type of GPT. And today I will show you and walk you through how I created it. By the way, feel free to drop a comment if you have experience with GPTs. And if so, tell me for what use case did you use it for? And if not, tell me uh, that you still haven't had the experience to use it, and I will show you how to. So the first thing I did was to create a chat GPT helper that helped you to create the content of a product page in an e-commerce website. So um, I told it something like that. I need you to be my marketing personal assistant. I have an e-commerce store that sells board games. This is specifically for an e-commerce store that sells board games. And whenever I'm going to give you the name of a board game, I want you to create the content of that product page. The content structure is name of the game, high end picture of the board game on a white background. By the way, this is the area where you could put your, um, your prompt template, like the one that Drew talked about. So dropping like a template of what type of picture would you like to include over there? A description of the game in one or two sentences. How many players is it for? Then uh, the playing time, the age, the weight. And then I tell it, whenever I give you the name of the game, ask me about the content it should include. And after I answer, please generate content for me. It basically took me a few seconds to create this agent. After I prompted to do that, he told me, but hey, I want you to tell me what is the name of the prompt. So he offered me names like Game Showcase Guru or Board Game Buzz Builder. And then I said, nope, give me a few more examples. Then we went with Game Page Pro. Then it gave me a nice picture of for my builder. And it says, here is the profile picture for Game Page Pro. How do you feel about it? Would you like any changes? Great. Now I have my own personal bot that create the product page content for me. And it's simple as that. I just go and I say, the game is the game is Katan. So I have a typo here. And then he asked me, give me all of the things um, that described here. And I said, this is a game where you steal animal farms for your friends. Uh, four players, 90 minutes, 16 plus, no need for the wait. Great. And then it actually generated uh, the product page 
uh, the content of the product page name cotton i know that it's not really cotton right just for the sake of the example uh, but it gives me the description the number also a picture of the game and so on so that's the uh, agent of game page pro now we will just check it live maybe someone in the chat could give me an example of a board game that they would like to create content for and then we could do that so game page pro um, I can't see your comments if you're offering any uh, uh, board game examples. But basically right now I'm in ChatGPT. I choose the game page pro and, and plugin. You can also, by the way, uh, I will share it with you so you could use it as well. And okay, so we don't have anyone here that want to give me an example. So I will just start and if you wait like one minute. Oh, I see double. Yeah. Oh, Dungeons and Dragons. Let's go for that. So now it's creating the images. Okay, we'll do also uh, your examples afterwards. Oh, I like the Hello Kitty Monopoly. I hope it's not going to tell me that it's not going to do it because of uh, copywriting things. All right, so this is the Dungeon and Dragons. It's pretty good. Okay. And yes, now we could go with it and add to the description. I will say four would be 80 minutes. Oh, I'm a bit excited. Four will be um, four players. And then five, it will be nine minutes. Recommended age will be 18 plus. And now I will tell it um, um, I don't know. I will tell it tone up. A little bit the description. Okay, so now it will just we will bounce ideas back and forth, and basically it will create it for me, which is awesome. Let's try the Hello Kitty Monopoly example. I hope we're not going to have any copywriting issues, and that's more or less about it. That's how you build your own uh, agent. And I will share with you the link to this specific agent too, so you could use it as well. Um, da, 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 da. let's do a new chat let's do hello kitty monopoly okay now it works in a better way because it actually bounced the, the questions for me which is what i intended originally and this is where capitalism meets Cats, I don't know. Ela elaborate. And four. Um, Twenty hours probably. Four. The recommend age ten to eighteen. Five. And. Kilo. All right now it's creating it. Okay, it's going to shortly create the description for me as well. And that's how we work with GPTs. And okay, while it's creating the image, let's see. Oh, it's beautiful. How beautiful is that? So uh, Simon is asking, I'm still having trouble understanding GPTs. How is this different than just asking ChatGPT to create this regular chat? Okay, that's a good question. So when I start with the new fresh GPT, 
and check it out. So, so I can tell it something like that. Write a blog post about Hello Kitty Monopoly, right? So now it's going to give me like a gen very generic way of like this blog post, okay? But in addition to that, I've created custom instruction for how to create blog posts um, when it comes to chat GPT. So right now let's let it to create the Hello Kitty Monopoly. The main difference is that when you loop your instructions before, you have like a, a consistent set of terms that will uh, give you different results. Means that I have here on the side, I'm not sure that you can check it out, but the game page pro will create only content for product pages of e-commerce store for boarding game. This is a very, very specific niche. This B-Day card will create me only a very specific B-Day card. This uh, empty state wizard will only write empty states for me. It's a very specific scenario. The edit with GPT will help me to edit stuff and Wordsmith will help me to write stuff and competitive analysis will help me to uh, compare with, between my, my competition and those would be completely different ways of using this tool. Okay, because... All of these are predefined ways to make ChatGPT communicate with me based on very specific use cases. Imagine that you have an army of agents like, like Jarvis for Iron Man and everyone like that is like a different Jarvis. So one is writing product page content while the other one help you to edit stuff and and yeah, that's more or less about it. And what's the most unique part about it is that all of them are predefined. So I don't have to have a template library. I can already define and uh, predefine the set of rules here. Let's create one together real quick before we'll jump into the Q&A. So right now I'm going into uh, explore GPTs and create a GPT. And I want, where did you get the inform? Okay, I will answer that later, but let's create, let's build a GPT right now that have one goal. And that the goal of this one would be to create um, um, real live stock images um for my for every need so i'm telling it please create a stock image of the of the subject that i share with you okay so you can make it way more complicated this is the simplest way to go and so great, yes. So we'll take one that creates stock images for us. So we wouldn't have to tell it every time, hey, please create a stock image. We will just send it to subject and we will get back a stock image. Okay, so now it's creating it for us. We predefine the GPT, by the way, it's only for paid users, which is like 20 bucks a month. I think it's worth getting that. Okay, and slowly but steady, it created it for us. And if I test it right here on the right, I will say to it something like, we need a stock image of um, a chess course. Okay. Uh, okay, so it's not really working. Ah, because I haven't predefined it yet. Okay, sorry, it's not configured yet. Now that we have the name, first define the role goals. Mm -hmm. You slowly, gradually define it. Okay. Just create a stock image of the item shared. Okay. Yes, we'll 
doing this thing and then we can jump to the q a or we could just slide to the q a while while it's building it and yeah and that's how you build the gpt basically uh, and uh, you see that afterwards i will just drop it a topic and then it will give me a picture uh, back so that's more or less about that and that's how you create your agent if you're interested to learn more about doing some AI design stuff, I recommend you to check uh, our new AI Design Academy. I will share it afterwards in the comments uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, add me also on LinkedIn. Don't be a stranger. Uh, it was fun. Thank you, Maple, for the opportunity. If you have a question, just drop me a line. That's it. Yuval, thank you so much. That was brilliant. I love it. And I love the project you did with the, uh, with the chef. That was great. Ah. For anybody that knows the chef, that's absolutely hilarious. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to introduce Tiffany, who's one of our maple experts. Hey, Tiffany. Hey, how are you? We're great. So we kind of wanted to all just maybe introduce yourself in a few minutes and then share how you use AI in your business, what you do, and then we'll all just take questions. So everybody just, comment and ask away any kind of question. You can be as specific as you want for a specific use case for your brand. We're, we're here to answer them. So yeah, take it away, Tiffany. So uh, my name is Tiffany. I am a growth marketing consultant uh, specializing in SEO and uh, mostly Google ads. Um, I And I'm also a founder of a card game company. So I was definitely very interested in <laughs> what I just saw. Um, a card game company called Flojo. And uh, we're a mindfulness card game company with products like the Couples Bucket List, Self Care Bucket List, Dads and Moms Bucket List. Um, so I use... Uh, AI for literally it, it's everything at this point. It's I, some of the, probably the weirdest ways I use it, which I, I shared with Ben last week and probably why I'm here. I literally ask ChatGPT to yell at me sometimes when I'm, if I'm about to go into a meeting that I know is going to be rough, or if there's certain results that I'm not seeing, I will go and say, what are the questions that, you know, a client's going to ask me like, where, where do you think, uh, I'm going wrong here. And these are the results I'm getting. What do you see that maybe I'm not seeing? Um, other areas, let's say I see I get a contract and I'm not sure what I'm looking at. I will ask ChatGPT to pull out things that I think that I need to ask questions about or I need to look a little bit deeper in. So I have prompts for like, a, I have different sections for like a lawyer um, that just, I just ask lawyer corporate law questions. Um, I've also uh, used it even for my card game business to be when I'm like kind of trying to come up with ideas uh, and I just needed like, you know, a, a different way of looking at it. I asked them, what other ideas do you have for uh, my, my company? What are, this is the current tagline for my company. Where do you think I'm missing out? And it's more of like the, where do you think? Why do you think? Because that will then help me think differently or think out of the box rather than asking it questions that I'm looking for an answer to, because it's so easy to just be like, no, I don't like it. Um, give me more, which doesn't really give me the right uh, answers to things. I want to know like how, why, um, what, what do you think is the best way of approaching this? And it, so it's just kind of my, I use it as that coworker that doesn't get to sit next to me <laughs> and probably for their own benefit, because they would, they would hate it. Uh, me just asking like the little questions here and there. So that's my side of things. Wow. And like, what kind of clients do you work with and how do you use AI for your clients? Um, so I have, uh, I do audit work. So I have a tendency to like, probably if I'm thinking of keywords or I'm not kind of understanding the themes of the keywords, I'll throw them all in and be like, do you see themes here? Uh, like these are the themes I'm picking out. What are other ones that I may not be seeing? So I'm always giving it kind of my thought process when I'm talking to it because um, I don't want to get the information that I already know. Like I, I already see these certain things. Give me something else. So I, I do that. Um, I have done, I'll, I'll test it with ads every once in a while, but I always use it as a draft because I'm, I'm a little, after all these years of, you know, doing titles, doing, it's been like 15, 16 years, I have a certain way of doing it, but I'll, I'll get it to do that first draft of work. And then I'll come in and I'll kind of do the tweak or maybe shorten it or come up with other ideas. Um, I also, if there is a client that maybe is looking for, 
maybe I've created the guts of a blog article and they're just not liking it. They just don't like the tone. I will create three different tones of it. So something like Martha Stewart Living, Huffington Post, or maybe this marketer that I like, and then I'll give it back to them and say, which one do you like better? Um, and then suddenly they're like, oh, okay, Martha Stewart Living works for me. So just kind of using it in different ways to like take something that I've already created um, and make it better or do that work that would just take so long for me to kind of think about like to think about how to write like Martha Stewart living, it would just break my brain uh, at this point, but it gets done in like 30 seconds, which is great. Wow, incredible. Okay, so we got some questions and any of you guys can answer them. I'm just gonna drop them on the screen. Go for it. Do you use AI to help project managers deliverables or timeframes? So I could answer that. Um, I, I actually just created, I had basically written all the things I wanted to do um, with an SEO project kind of planning my next three months. But at this point it looked like gibberish and I just like could, it was like one of those moments where it's, I love AI because when you're, when your brain is kind of, going down one path, it's sometimes hard to, to switch it. And so I I'll take something like, these are all the projects I wanna be working on. This is what I'm thinking in the next three months. Can you create a table for me that will better uh, make, make this look better or make this look more organized? And then I'll use that as like a starting point. And sometimes they come up with stuff that, and I'll also say with that, can you add anything that I'm missing here? Um, and so that way it'll ask me more questions of what it will look like. Of course, I always prompt it with like, you are an expert project manager working in blah, blah, blah space and, and kind of making sure I, I give it all the right prompts um, because I, I want that particular lens to be looking at it. But that's how I've been uh, using it lately. Maybe. Yeah, that's a good one. I think it's, you know, like in a similar way to what she just mentioned, it, it's a great way to identify gaps right like so even like let's just take for example this presentation i put together right if i know the topic i want to talk about and i know certain pieces of how i want that to lay out but i'm not sure you know tiffany brought this up but like what questions could be asked or making sure the connective tissue is there that i'm not like skipping over something it's great for that right like there are just so many possibilities with ai in its current state um I have trouble just identifying one because it's like, it's an hourly thing for me now. It sounds like Tiffany, maybe you're the same way, but like it's crossed that whole threshold of personal professional, right? Like it does both sides of that. I have different needs on both ends. I think the category thing, uh, the categorization uh, point that you brought up is, is another big one that I've used it for um, specifically with SEO, right? Like long tail keyword search it, like things like that. It's fantastic for data aggregation, I mean, the, the end cases are uh, like the use cases are endless. I think it's more a matter of if you've got the awareness to use it in a certain capacity. And I think that comes with using it enough, right? Like putting in the reps um, to use it. You start to unlock, oh, I actually could probably use, you know, ChatGPT or Claude for this, right? So uh, I think part of it's just being around it and being immersed in it enough to then open other doors up for you. Absolutely. Here's another question from Simon. Have you found a way to use ChatGPT to analyze data from an ad platform and give you recommendations? I don't so have anything on this one, Tiffany. You got you got something for this? So this one is tough because it doesn't allow too much information, and so I'm always worried about what it's looking at this like smaller sample and not and making the wrong. Um, like leaps as a result. So what I suggest, if you are trying to use it to analyze, you really got to know the information um, that you're looking at. You can't just take something that you've never really seen before that you kind of like. The, the big thing about um, ChatGPT that I, I've really made sure that I do is I don't allow it chances to hallucinate. And if if they if it is going to hallucinate, I got to know the subject matter so well that I'll be able to spot it. And so I don't rely on it. I'm very I'm suspicious in general. So like <laughs> I have to always kind of make sure I'm, I'm wearing that suspicion on me all the time. So stuff like looking at data, 
it's it's always been hard for me unless it's really small sample and if it's that you know a thousand um i think it's a thousand words or whatever it is that fine um but uh, that's where i kind of draw the line when it comes to ads but there's been certain situations where maybe i'm not seeing um something with ugh, i'm trying to think of like a, a prime example example i know i've thrown like ad copy and stuff in there with its results to see if i may be missing something or maybe missing um something that a pattern with the ones that are working um, and asked it to kind of look at that because it's a little bit different way of analyzing, but not necessarily here's a chunk of data and like tell me things about it unless I absolutely know what they're looking at. I have this, um, I think that something that may be possible would be to use somehow the, um, the API of uh, OpenAI where you could actually loop some data through the, the API. And I know it sounds technical, but there are some no-code solutions out there. If you explore, uh, that might be handy, like uh, using no-code tools such as Make, if you're familiar with Make, or Zapier, that could actually take some pieces of data, loop them through the API of... Um, Open AI. The only uh, disadvantage, disadvantage of that is that it will cost a lot of uh, tokens, right? So the more data that you have to loop in that API, the more data that it's going to use, the more tokens it's going to use. And then every time you will run it, it will be uh, expensive. Anyway, I hope I made sense. Uh, I know that there is another tool by Anthropic. Um, which is another uh, AI, Claude is the name. And I think that they have more capabilities to actually run your data files. So probably a good process over there would be to export your uh, data analytics from your ads platform to a CSV, and then check if you can upload it to Cloud, or maybe go to the playground of OpenAI and try to play with the with the direct access to the API. Anyway, I hope it made sense, but uh, I think that might be a potential solution. I have a question for you guys. If you were to start a business today, would you create all of it with AI? Like, would you even need to hire a designer or developer or social media manager, copywriter? Would you just do it all with AI? Oh man, no, because it's I still don't have the time. <laughs> it still, it still takes. I mean, I have Flojo, right? And 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 like in my head, I was like, oh, there's gonna be so many tasks that I could do with it. And like, yeah, if you have everything automated and if you start kind of building out the automation of it, maybe. Um, but I know, like, with um, some of the designs that I have created, even though like they look really good, um, they uh, they still don't have like I like such a great designer that it still doesn't think like him. Um, and I don't want, I don't want it to. So I think it's like, it just depends on how you look at it and the type of, uh, what kind of product you want to create at the end. I mean, there's certain ones in terms of like, I think t-shirt design is just going to get crazy because people are going to start using it for all the like t-shirt designs and, uh, all that kind of like, you know, digital prints and, and those sorts of things, which is um, expected. Um, but I, I still think it, like social media wise, I, I started doing posts with it and then I'm like, this is terrible. I don't, I don't like this at all. And then I just went right back to, <laughs> to my own. So I, I think it's definitely depends on uh, the person, but for, I haven't been able to switch over yet. Yeah. All, all is a strong word, you know, I, I like there's, there's obviously still a huge, huge, huge value in having humans involved in a lot of tasks. Right. But there, there are obviously some, you know, how, when, and why is that AI is just a, a clear and obvious, you know, solution for. So I think it's just, it's about identifying what works for you, right? And, you know, some of those things do require more of a human touch to them. Um, but the illusion, right, that you get back more time is tough because technically you do, but you end up filling that time again, right? So, like, you know, to document how much time and money you actually do save with these things is probably not anything that we're all like picking and tallying along the way, but it opens us up to do more work. Um, so it's, it's hard to say sometimes. I, I think like people can lean into probably things that they uh, either like to do or have a passion for or believe 
uh, are better served manually or with a, a human involved. So, in my opinion, it's pretty obvious that uh, just like uh, Tiffany and Drew said, you can't use right now AI to like you can't right now be a one person show. But um, what what's happening right now is that you hold probably as an individual running a business or starting a new business, you have a lot of uh, knowledge about how you plan to use this type of AI tools. So as a business owner or as a fresh business owner, I would recommend you to identify patterns and systems that you could afterwards delegate, delegate sorry. And for example, let's say that uh, uh, I'm creating a new board game right now, right? Let's take uh, uh, Tiffany's example. And right now I have this kind of flow where every week I'm creating um, new graphics for my ads. All right, so this is something that I could systemize. So I'm trying to figure out what kind of prompts I'm writing, what kind of uh, tools I'm using. Is it ChatGPT? Is it MidJourney? Is it some kind of a system, which is a mix of both? And then uh, I can hire uh, some kind of an assistant that if I had to hire that person like one year ago, maybe it was like a graphic designer and then like an editor and then like a writer, but now it can be maybe this personal assistant just use AI and could do that specific system in that I delegated to, to them. So yeah, have like systematic approach about how you use it and then delegate it and then keep building and growing the business. That's uh, that would be my, what I would do maybe. That's a great answer. So you could save money by combining roles. Essentially, you have a process, you get one person to do it. And delegate them because as Stephen Andrew said, you don't earn that time back. You, you, you earned it by delegating it and your time is more expensive. So you need to think about the next, I don't know, maybe another board game or maybe another funnel, another marketing funnel or another system that you'll build and delegate. Amazing. It was a board themed uh, event today, in a way. <laughs> Alton asking, how would you trust AI to make decisions for you? Well, this whole presentation, we're all created with AI. So we're all actually just chilling out in the Bahamas. And you trust us? <laughs> this is really accurate. Like he even did my nose. <laughs> but uh... I don't know. Like, I don't know that I. I'm trying to think if I really solely trust it for anything specifically that's subjective. You know what I mean? I, I think if it's subjective and it's not black and white, it's more or less a voice of reason and a, an unbiased voice of reason at that, right? Because it's it's not emotional, right? So I think a lot of what Tiffany already brought up about identifying voids or making sure I'm, you know, like, did I think about everything comprehensively? Is there anything that I missed? Right. Or given the context that I've provided you, like, is there anything else that's relevant uh, that you see? Like, you know, so I think from a from a subjective standpoint, it's more or less a, a sounding board, a voice of reason, unbiased uh, from an objective standpoint. It's a little bit more black and white. I think, yeah, it, it can absolutely make decisions for you. That's maybe I haven't heard that question before. It's a great one. But I'm, I'm just thinking in the time that I heard it and answering it right now, that's how I'm thinking. I, uh, I actually think about this a lot, mostly because of the way when I started talking to people, some of the people that I know that use it a lot, I started seeing them trust it a thousand percent so that it was kind of starting to run certain things, answer, answer certain things, and they're kind of just you no know, copying and pasting. And that made me kind of take a moment to go like, oh, no, I can't do that. Like, I, I, I have to, there has to be some sort of process like something within my process that makes me double check and ask the question um and i think like both and it's, it's something you kind of have to and i come th this i come from like literally my degree in university was critical theory <laughs> so this is like it's embedded in me to ask questions to be like why like why is this working and i think well, before i always go into something i go do i actually know if the answer would be correct and that's like something that I always kind of keep in the back of my mind, would I, would I know if it was false or not? And that has really helped me with the way I ask the question, because if I'm asking us something like, um, you know, going through this contract, what are the things I need to look at? 
I don't know if that's right. So I'm like, what kind of questions should I be asking a lawyer about this? Or what are the questions I should be asking my uh, client about this specific section so that I can better understand the thinking behind it and decide then whether or not that's the right way of going about it. Um, Cause I notice, uh, and I, I, I teach um, SEO SEM at a university. So like I get answers back that I know are copied and pasted because they just don't make sense. And so I see a lot of the kind of other side of the, the trust factor. Um, and I think I won't notice, but there's like little things that I can see that I'm like, oh man, like you could have just taken a, like three seconds to read this and, and just fix it up a little. Um, so I'm with a lot of cases, what I see there is they're not subject matter experts, so they don't necessarily know what the answer is. Um, and I think that's where it becomes a little bit difficult. So like if you're, I always say, if you're going to go into, let's say, and I say it to my students, if you're going into SEO, learn SEO first, like learn it, like understand what the rules are, understand the processes, understand that, and then use this to help you until it gets to a point where it's like it knows all and it can give you all the right answers. But for me, when I when I prompt SEO stuff, I, I get answers that are wrong a lot. Uh, and so like I can't trust it um, for SEO. And so I, I, when I think about that, I go, can I really trust it for the other things that I'm asking? Probably not. So let me ask it in a different way. Great answer. Okay, another question. Do you have any best practices for prompting? Um, you, you know, like, I still don't know if everybody's using custom instructions. If you're not, you should be. So essentially, that is something that you can put onto your profile in the back end of ChatGPT, for example, where you can give it directions or instructions that you don't have to repeat every time. Right. So like, do you like markup? Do you like, you know, things that are bolded and bulleted out? Do you like short sentences and paragraphs? You know, do you like um, a certain way of reasoning or a certain tone in the responses? Like things like that. I would I would batch those things up and feed those into the custom instructions. Like those some of those things that you just know you use a lot and that way you don't have to do it every time. So I think like that's a probably a pretty easy way to to think about that. But um in general, I think my approach is just depends on the, the scenario, right? Like, I think it's it's a it's a new language to a lot of people, right? To prompt uh, machine or technology to give you what you want. So I think we've mentioned this a lot, but it's a lot of just experimentation, putting in the reps, getting like iterating with it, right? Like you're not going to get the best response if you're giving it one to two sentences of context unless you're just brainstorming something. Right. So so make sure you take the time to give it all the context, the details. Don't be afraid to ask the LLM. Hey, look, like, are there any other questions you need to ask me in order to get, you know, to make this as accurate as possible? That's another thing that you can do. You can put that in your custom instruction. So, um, yeah, I, I think I would start there. And have you tried using multiple models to cross reference? Do that a lot, especially with models? like content specific things. Um, I love using Claude as well. I think Claude's fantastic. Amazing. Anyone else? Nothing here. I uh, I just I kind of as I'm reading the answers, I just it's more of like if you're thinking of it as a draft, I think you're going to naturally kind of spot stuff that don't necessarily look right and maybe cross reference naturally. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it just depends on what is the type of information I'm asking, like, is it like a calculator <laughs> or is it like code or is it um, like maybe a reference to something like a, a study that did that i'll go and go like does this study actually exist things like that amazing brilliant wow well that totally opened my mind up to new possibilities and uh really fascinating how each one of you guys uses ai totally differently using the same principles but totally in different use cases and and um 
Yeah, you know, the sky's the limit. It's like we're only in the tip of the iceberg experimenting. All of the people here in the panel and the people that stayed right here in the audience are, you know, the pioneers of what's going to happen. Hopefully only good things, but, uh, you know, creating good products, good processes, changing humanity for good. There's like uh, a lot of opportunities that literally everyone can pick up right now and just experiment and create something that probably no one ever created before them. So just go ahead, experiment, play with it, share your insights with the community and add each other on LinkedIn. That would be the community for now. And, uh, and have fun with it. It's a, probably all of the people that are here are having a lot of fun uh, while creating those tools. There's a lot of mind blowing aspects. Uh, to do that kind of stuff so just don't hesitate just play with it and enjoy yourself for sure and uh, you can definitely reach out to all these wonderful people for questions or help with anything also at maple we have a, a community of over a thousand marketers so if you need somebody to help you with your chat gpt prompting for ads or for influencer marketing or for Email marketing, we have tons of people that have experience in your niche. So definitely you can uh, skip the learning curve completely and get the results you want. Um, and yeah, totally appreciate all of you guys. Thank you so much for your time and for your knowledge. And um, till next time. See you on the next event. See you guys soon. Ciao. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thank you.